come here, it seems like it's just out of control, like it's complete chaos. But when your eyes kind of adjust to it after you spend a little bit of time here, you realize there is an order to it. There, there are lanes, there's organization, uh, and, and people have respect for one another. You, there, you don't see a lot of fights. You don't see uh, pushing. Sure, tempers may flare from time to time. It's an extraordinarily stressful situation. But, but there are kind of unwritten rules, and, and people, um, you know, are forced to live very close together. And, and, and so far, at least in this area, they seem to be getting along. That's some of what we saw in Leogon again. It's about 20 miles from here. It takes about an hour to get here. Roads are kind of uh, crowded. People are living outside in tent cities. They have nowhere else to go. A lot of the buildings there ha have been destroyed. I want to talk to some of our correspondents who've been covering this crisis now for 10 days. Uh, stories of, of heartbreak and, and hope. I'm joined by my uh, colleagues, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, Gary Tuckman, and, and by Ivan Watson. That is one of the things I, I think that when you first get here, things seem chaotic, but there is really an order here. There, is, there are unwritten rules, and even in these tent cities, you know, even if some aid organization hasn't come in and organized things, there's kind of little markets sprout up, people selling goods, uh, kind of life finds a way to, to, to move forward. I, we saw this uh, yesterday. Uh, bazaars have set up, you know, uh, impromptu bazaars, and people even rigged up car batteries and they charge uh, people the equivalent of 50 cents to charge their phones in the mm -hmm. middle of a refugee camp. Yeah. You saw, what, what did you see today? What, what? We, we traveled a little bit past Leogan uh, to a place that was called uh, Petit Paradis, that means little paradise. Mm -hmm. And it was actually hit by a tsunami, a localized tsunami, mm -hmm. tragically, on top of the earthquake. Uh, that killed, by our count, uh, at least seven locals there. Mm. There'd been a tsunami warning on the day of the earthquake, right. but it was withdrawn. But we've since talked with experts, and it is possible to have localized tsunamis like that uh, in areas very close to the epicenter. In, in these towns, which are farther away from Port-au-Prince, I mean, so much focus has been Port-au-Prince. These little towns have they gotten the attention? No aid whatsoever. Uh, there was a nun trying to distribute some rice and pop tarts. They flocked to her car. She had to drive away, and they chased her car. But we did see Marines and U.S. Navy Seabees arriving. Uh, on amph in amphibious boats, ships, and they say they're going to start distributing aid this weekend. And Gary, what did you do today? I had a meeting with a woman I will never forget the rest of my life. Her name is Fresilia Seytout. <laughs> and this was at a tent city on a soccer field. Thousands of people living on a soccer field in tents. And Fresilia is into her second century of life. She's 109 years old. 109. 109. She was born in 1900. She's always had roof over her head. Her house was destroyed. Her 17-year-old great-granddaughter carried her out of the house after it came down. The whole family is now in a tent, the daughter, great-granddaughter, cousins, eight people in this tiny tent, and asked her how she was feeling, and she says, I'm sad because I'm blind, and I lived in my house for so long, I knew where I was going. And now in the tent, I don't know where I'm going anymore. Nevertheless, she was smiling the whole time and laughing. She laughed at a joke when I asked her what year she was born, and she didn't remember at first. And I said, don't, don't worry. I don't remember what year I was born, because I was so young when I was born, I didn't remember it either. And she laughed, which I appreciate, of course. <laughs> but she was smiling so much, I said, how come you smile so much? And she said that if I don't laugh, I'll cry. Mm. So, did you know how long you're going to stay? I mean, have you... Um, you know, it's funny, I, I don't know the exact day that we're going to leave, but it, I, I've been thinking to myself sort of uh, all along, I, I'd like to be able to report some good stories. I'd like to be able to report some stories uh, uh, of recovery of the things that we've been talking about for some time. You know, it was nice today in some ways. I, I had a similar experience, I think, to, to Gary's. I, I went out to one of these tent cities. And I, I wasn't sure what to expect, but um, first thing that we saw when we got there was a kid was flying a kite that he sort of made out of a, a paper, a, a paper yeah. plate, and uh, he was flying that, and everyone around him was laughing. It was very clean as well, people sweeping up the area. Yeah. There wasn't the squalor that I sort of expected. And uh, there was also uh, some, of the, some of the sort of commerce, that I think, that you're alluding to, right. people trying to sell things, and including water being distributed and, and all of that. I mean, it's, it's not permanent settlements, but uh, it seemed like a, you know, a, a pretty good uh, uh, sort of temporary house housing and also one that would probably not be one that would be at risk for disease and, and I mean life really does move forward here even amidst the rubble people uh, are I mean figuring out new ways to survive and, and I mean it's not it's painful and, and there is sorrow everywhere and everybody seems to have lost somebody I mean that's that's the thing I think you know it, maybe that doesn't crum, come across on television is that um, just the, the loss infuses everybody's life here I mean and, and you know they're, they're not crying about it openly on the streets but it's got to just change everything about everybody's life. Very different situations, but it reminds me of September 11th and the days after New York City. You know, 3,000 people died in 9-11, but when you went throughout New York City, everyone knew someone or knew mm. someone who knew someone. Here it's obviously a much bigger toll, but it's the same kind of feeling that there's no one 
who's escaped unscathed. Yeah. Um, do, do, what? Uh, explain to Ivan how you work every day. I mean, you know, we all basically just kind of go out and we have a destination in mind, but you don't always make it to the destination because something else kind of comes up. It, it really is pretty random. You Sometimes you have a goal in mind, oh, we're going to go and, and, and talk to this person somewhere, and along the way you see something that just blows your mind or you see a gathering and... And, and we just planned to drive out west because nobody, I'd never been out there. And we saw a cluster of people on the side of the road and it was a nun trying to give out food. And she had to hide in her car to get away from the hungry crowd. And that, things lead from there. There was a, and then we started talking to a fisherman there and they said our boats got destroyed. And I thought it was from the earthquake. It turned out it was from a giant wave that swept mm. a lot of their relatives out to sea. Mm. And, and that's what happens in a situation like this. Do you see, do you see improvement? I mean, do you see that today was better than yesterday? I think in Port-au-Prince we see some signs of improvement, but what really came home to me was out in the provinces, it's, uh, there's been little to no change. Yeah. Uh, well, we, uh, I, I think that one thing our viewers want to know is, is how we live. They, they've been asking me a lot on emails and on Twitter. And I think one thing that's really interesting, before I came to this earthquake, we always hear a lot during earthquakes about how people stay outside even if they have homes because they're scared of the aftershocks. And I think a lot of us wonder, why don't you go into your house if it's good? Well, what our viewers should know is that all of us CNNers are staying at this hotel and other journalists are staying here too. And I'm not going to name any names, but there are a number of people who've decided among the journalist corps to sleep outside. They're not comfortable because we've had so many aftershocks, including two this morning. Yeah, no. Uh, I, I sleep inside because I, I figure, like, you know, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So. And you see all the people coming out in the, in the hallways, uh, often in their boxer shorts. <laughs> That's I will say when one of the bigger, when one of the aftershocks hit, I put on a pair of jeans and stood in the doorway, and I, I kind of thought to myself, is, is this how I would want to be found? Like, you know, like, hey. so anyway, I guess it shows how vain I am. Uh, Ivan, thank you very much. Gary as well, and, and uh, Dr. Gupta as well, Sanjay. Uh, a lot to report on here, a lot of stories to tell. We've been here a week and a half now. A photographer has been traveling with us, helping to capture all the images. We're going to show you some behind-the-scenes uh, images you haven't seen in a, in a reporter's notebook. We'll be right back.